morning, everybody, and thank you for joining the Western Energy Imbalance Market Resource Efficiency and Evaluation Enhancement Call. Uh, today we'll be discussing the Phase 1B Final Analysis. My name is Isabella Nicosia, representing ISO Stakeholder Affairs, and I'll be facilitating the web conference today. Um, the presentation for this call, along with the two final analysis reports, are out on the uh, WEIM Resource Efficiency Evaluation Enhancements webpage on the California ISO website. So you can get there by going to kaiso.com, and then under the Stay Informed tab, you'll click Policy Initiatives, and then navigate down to this uh, initiative webpage. Um, so today I'm joined by Guillermo Batista Alberte from Market Analysis and Forecasting, along with Amber Motley, also short-term forecasting, and then Kevin Head and Katie Wickler from Market Analysis, and um, they'll be giving the presentation today. Um, so before we get started, I have a couple reminders I'd like to go through. Um, so this call is being recorded. The recording is for informational and convenience purposes only and any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. And these calls are structured to stimulate an open dialogue and engage different perspectives. Um, so we look forward to a good discussion today. And then in the interest of time, please refrain from repeating or reiterating what has already been said, just so we can uh, manage the time efficiently. And then if you need any technical assistance during the call today, uh, please send a chat to the event producer. Um, her name is Shreya. We will be taking questions throughout the call today, so if you connected to audio through your computer or used the call me option, um, then you can raise your hand by clicking the raise hand icon located um, on the right hand side above the chat window. But if you just dialed in and did not connect to computer audio or have the WebEx call you, you'll need to uh, press pound two to enter the queue. And then when asking your question, please just remember to state your name and affiliation. And then you can also send your question through the chat to either myself, again, my name is Isabella Nicosia, or you can send it to all panelists. So with that, I will turn it over to Guillermo and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Isabella. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Yes. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the final report that we put together for the efforts that we indicated in the earlier versions of this uh, analysis. And uh, let me just give you the background on how we are here. Uh, when we completed the previous uh, stakeholder initiative regarding the resource efficiency evaluation, there were still some areas of interest that require further discussion and potentially exploration of enhancements or changes. As part of that, a commitment to continue to assess and find enhancements in this area, the CAISO committed to continue to do further analysis regarding specific areas. And back in February, we initiated this analysis phase that we label as the resource efficiency evaluation phase 1B. And part of the plan was to have a final analysis provided by the end of May. Now we're in the middle of June. And along the way, we have a couple of opportunities to discuss the preliminary analysis that we have carried out at that point on time. We have a middle checkpoint somewhere in March, another in April, and now we are coming with the final version of the report. The areas of interest for this analysis fall in four main groups. The first one is the interaction of the Western energy imbalance market transfers, imports or exports, with the hourly intertie CAISO transactions, imports and exports. Another area was the interaction, the implication of load conformance and the resource efficiency evaluation. There was also a lot of interest from participants to better understand the logic and have a good assessment of the implications of calculating the flexible ramping requirements using a more elaborated methodology that we have called the quantile regression methodology. That is an improvement, a more sophisticated version of the current requirement calculation that we have in place using the historical approach, the histogram approach. And then the last part was also one area that we started analyzing at the very end of the previous stakeholder initiative, 
regarding the uh, how accurate the intertide deviation adder was uh, to capture the uncertainty related to intertide deviation. Uh, along the way, in the last two preliminary phases of the analysis, including the stakeholder calls, we have presented to some extent material along these four elements. Now, uh, when we move from the first stage to the second stage and to this final report, we have been expanding the analysis. Some analysis have been already completed since the beginning of the first phase. And what we, what we have done for the final version is effectively expand and append the, the analysis that we have with the new information. The incremental changes you may see through the two reports that we posted in comparison to the last round of analysis that we have is more analysis about the, the implications of the WIM transfers and the hourly interties. Uh, at, back in the last round, we only have a couple of hours as a sample, as a proof of concept. And now we were able to expand that for covering multiple days. I think we covered about 16, 18 different days of the summer conditions and a sample day of January. And we also have an assessment of the implications of using the new requirement calculation and how that interplays with the outcome of the resource efficiency evaluation. If we have now a different way to calculate the requirements for FRP, how that new requirement is going to impact eventually the outcome of the resource efficiency evaluation, specifically the flexible ramping test. So we have a dedicated sec section that covers that um, interplay. And we also have uh, some other metrics along the way of the interaction of hourly interties with wind transfers, uh, including, for instance, the, the, the profile of the requirements along the test and the different markets in the real time. The analysis is composed of two main reports, one that covers the FRP requirements, the evaluation of the intertake deviation adder, the evaluation and assessment of the FRP requirements on the flexible ramping test. And the second report covers effectively the interaction between the wind transfers and the hourly interties and the implications of load conformance in the resource efficiency evaluation. These are the two reports that we put together and capture the final scope of the analysis that we discussed along the way for the last three, four months. Uh, for today, uh, I, we are not expecting to go over every single detail. There is a lot of information to spend at least a full day trying to go into the nuances of each area of the analysis. Instead, we are trying to come with the takeaways and what are the main points uh, out of this analysis. There are many others that we are not explicitly pointing in this presentation, but all the information is available in the reports. I would encourage participants to, to read the reports, and I think that would be a very good reference moving forward through the stakeholder process regarding the resource efficiency evaluation. And having that as a basis, I believe it serves as a good foundation, provides factual information of what's really happening in the market to better inform uh, the discussion in the stakeholder initiative. With that uh, preamble, let's go straight into the areas, uh, and the presentation is organized in these four areas. So let's start with the first topic, and that is the interaction of the wind transfers, imports, and exports with the hourly intertide. Next slide, please. One of the areas that we analyze is the implications of having the wind transfers uh, in terms of clearing hourly interties, either imports and exports. We know we have a very complex uh, market clearing process through the real-time optimization in which we take into account all the inputs, including the bids from the uh, KISO resources, including the bids from the hourly interties, plus all the bids from every single resource participating in any of the energy imbalance areas. Uh, when it comes to solve the real-time market, either the HASP, the FMM, or the RTD, uh, we take into account all that bit stack available, uh, subject to all the constraints that we may have in the system, including internal transmission constraints, transfer resource limitations, 
to come with the optimal dispatch. And as part of that, a byproduct of that is that we can estimate what is going to be effectively the wind transfers. The wind transfers are not explicitly a variable that we optimize, it's the result of having these imbalances between areas. If there is an area that has an excess of supply, effectively that means it's going to represent a wind uh, export. It's going to be sending power out of that area because it's generating beyond its needs to meet uh, its own load obligation. If there is an area that is uh, with a shortfall of supply or um, that means that it's going to rely on an EIM transfer import to balance its own demand. And that is simply the economic displacement of different resources across the different areas, trying to maximize that economic value. As a byproduct of this clearing process, the wind transfers become one of the components that determine the optimal solution. Now, when we go into the different markets, and let's say starting with HASP, the early scale processing market, this is the last opportunity for hourly interties, meaning KISO intertie transactions to clear, either imports or exports, in addition to what was clearing the day ahead market. On the other hand, any other transactions, any other schedules such as internal resources, to either KISO or any other EIM area have what we call advisory schedules because they are part of the optimization, they are part of the solution, we have to come with those optimal dispatches, but they are not financially binding, they are not operationally binding because it's only in this pre-scheduling process that are part of the solution. In this case, only the hourly intertie transactions, either imports or exports, are going to be binding. When we move from HAS to the RTPD market, the conditions continue to be relatively the same. We have schedules that are financially binding for resources, and in some cases there may be very few 15-minute intertie for KISO transactions that may still settle on and clear on these 15-minute markets. But overall, the hourly transactions that were already cleared in the HAS market now are taken and given a fix. They are not re-optimized in this 15-minute market. But anything else is still subject to change based on the economics, based on the conditions that are prevalent to, to that market run. In this case, there is no mechanism, there is no constraint in the market uh, enforcing that whatever was clearing the hub for these advisory transactions, for these advisory dispatches or transfers, have to hold fit for the FMM. They are re-optimized from scratch based on economics and the current system conditions. And the same happens when we go into the RTD market. Now, the only difference here in the RTD market is that uh, any dispatches for internal resources for KISO or EIM area are both financially and operationally binding. They have to be followed. They are going to settle based on the clearing prices of the real-time market. This is what we call the financially binding instructions and dispatches. This is quite different to the, to the perspective of the advisory transfers that we have from the hash market because as, uh, as we move along the way, these transfers are going to continue to be advisory in FMM and eventually they become a byproduct of the financially binding instructions also binding. All this preamble is to introduce this metric that we discussed in the previous analysis, and that is Given the conditions that we have across the different markets in the real-time market, there is this uh, consistent trend in which the transfer imports coming into the KISO in the HASP market are persistently and consistently uh, unrealized in the five-minute market. Uh, and here the advisory versus the binding is relevant because even though there may be a meaningful amount of transfers in the hard market clear, they are advisory. There is nothing in forcing them to hold at that value through the rest of the market. It's only the transfer realized in the five-minute market that becomes, I would say, operationally binding. And why is this important? Well, there is an interplay that we have discussed in the previous rounds in which part of the optimization is to clear the hourly interties, including the exports. And through this analysis, we have realized that there are conditions, typically in the tight conditions of the summer, in which 
the advisory EIM transfers imports coming to the CAISO may be supporting to some extent exports that are clearing for the CAISO transactions. And even though the import transfers are advisory in nature, they may be unrealized in the real-time market, in the five-minute market. The, the resulting clearing exports that were coming from HASP, they remain fixed after HASP. So we effectively hold the uh, obligation to serve those exports, even though the imports may not be anymore there in the five-minute market to support those exports. And this trend is basically showing that the transfers going from HAT and FMM to RTD are consistently unrealized. And the portion in blue in negative effectively means that is a buyback of the transfers going from the FMM market to the RTD market. Next slide, please. During the stakeholder initiative of a year ago or so, there was this concern that effectively by having these EIM transfers coming into the CAISO, the CAISO may be utilizing the WIM import transfers to meet its own load. And at least through the days that we have analyzed for the summer conditions of 2021, we find that the, the accounting doesn't play that way. Given the fact that we have specific exports to clear in the real time, and I'm talking about these exports that show up in the real time, there may be exports that come from the day ahead, they carry over into the real time, they get somehow the firmness from the day ahead market, but there are also exports that may come in the last minute in the real time market. They may come economically or with self schedules, basically wanting to be price takers, and in some cases they may be able to clear. When an export is put with a price taker, effectively they are willing to take any price. And effectively, we are talking about the penalty prices. And that means that the market is going to find the last megawatt available to be able to meet those exports because they are on price quite high. On the other end, when we have the imports coming to the CAISO, it's additional supply that we take into account to meet not only the CAISO load, but also to meet the exports that were clear in the HAT process. When we do this balancing account between what is coming in versus what is going out, we can see in this trend that the positive portion is the RTD transfers coming into the CAISO. This is additional supply for CAISO to meet load and export. The other two colors, the one in red and green, are for the exports. These are the real-time additional obligations that we are clearing in the real-time market. And this could signal what is the total balance of additional supply or demand that the system has to meet in the real-time market. And when you do the balance, effectively, the, the dotted line, the black line overlapping on these areas, indicates the net position. If you have, let's say, a, a transfer coming into the CAISO of 1,000 megawatts, and at the same time we clear 3,000 megawatts of exports, the net position for CAISO is still an export of 2,000 megawatts. Even though we are bringing 1,000 megawatts of imports, that is partially to offset the additional obligation of meeting the exports. And for the critical days of the summer time frame, you can see that consistently, for the peak hours, how ending 17, 18, 19, that trend is quite persistent in which the net position for CAISO is of the next export. That means the clearing exports in the real time were greater, generally speaking, than the import transfers coming into the CAISO. There are further implications on this, and one of those is that uh, when we go into the resource efficiency evaluation test, we take into account the level of exports that we clear is part of the net schedule interchange. Effectively, it's going to increase our load obligation or it's going to reduce our uh, bid stack because it's additional load obligation. But on the other end, the transfers that may have been advisor in the HASP market to clear those exports uh, may not realize, and therefore they are not 
counted as an additional supply in the resource efficiency evaluation. This creates this asymmetrical accounting of the obligation and supply made available for CAISO to, to, to be accounted in the, in the test. Next slide, please. When we did additional counterfactual analysis, we were trying to estimate in a counterfactual basis how much exports could be supported by the clearing of these advisory transfers. If we have, let's say, 3,000 megawatts of imports cleared in half, import transfers cleared in half, and eventually they realize only a thousand megawatts of those in the real time market. We have a buyback on realized transfers of two thousand megawatts. How much exports could have been supported by these two thousand megawatts of import transfers? This is part of the counterfactual analysis that we did and that is captured in detail in how we approach that counterfactual in the report. And doing this counterfactual analysis allows us to somehow isolate the portion of exports that could potentially clear because uh, the import transfers come into the CAISO. That otherwise, if these transfers were not in there, these exports wouldn't clear. Now, when we reduce effectively or do the counterfactual analysis of assuming only the realized import transfers into the market, there may be other movements. It's not only the, the exports that are going to be impacted. It could be also that we are going to have an additional or changes of internal supply in the CAISO system. Uh, this graph effectively shows uh, what are the implications when we uh, isolate the effect of the unrealized uh, import transfers coming into the CAISO. If we don't have that supply accounted anymore, what are the changes that are going to happen across the system? Either reduction of exports, uh, increasing of additional supply, and relaxation of the power balance, all this is going to move along the way to, to still keep the balance in place. And I can tell you that uh, in the report, you may see that there are two main interplays. One is that effectively, if we don't have that additional supply from import transfers, effectively we're going to have less exports clear. That is one obvious case that we have found, and that is typically observed when we are in these very tight supply conditions. Effectively, there is no more supply. And if we don't have these additional transfers, what is going to happen? Well, we have to reduce demand, including the reduction of export. There are other days that capture the second trend, and that is there is still supply available. So when we reduce or didn't account for the unrealized transfers, given the fact that supply is, is still available, this translates in no more than an economic displacement. So effectively, we we back up the loss of the supply from the import transfers by movement or in incremental supply from internal resources. And that makes sense because we are dealing with days in which we still have supply available and we reduce the import transfers, the consequence is going to be that we can still meet that additional export by incrementally dispatching internal resources. Uh, let me pause here. This is the first part. This is the interaction of the wind import transfers with the outlet interties. And before we move to the next topic, I would like to see if we have any comments or questions. Uh, Isabella, operator, this is a good time for questions. Sure. As a reminder, if you're connected to the computer audio or use the call me feature in WebEx, you may enter the question queue by using the WebEx raise hand icon located just above the chat panel. You'll hear a beep tone when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. I do see one caller in the queue. Please go ahead, your line is unmuted. Hi, Guillermo. Good morning, this is Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. Um, two uh, hopefully quick questions here. One was just in your looking at the data, have you seen any price taker export volume sensitivity to the level of the offer cap that's in place um, during these hours in the market? Just uh, not remembering going back to these specific days, you know, if any of them were triggering the $2,000 offer cap and 
if so, whether that had any bearing on the uh, level of, of uh, price taker exports that were bid into the market. Okay, yeah, <laughs> you are stretching my memory now. I don't recall that we have any day in the summer of 2021 when we triggered the 2000. So we may have to go back and check if there was any specific days. If they were, they may have been very few, so that we don't have very good uh, recollection of that happening. So I, I can take that back. I just don't recall if we had any of those days. Thanks. And, you know, my question is just kind of directed at hoping that we can use some of this analysis in the uh, price formation initiative as well, just to kind of look at what's going on and during some of these tighter days and what, um, you know, impact, if any, um, you know, pricing in RTD had on, on uh, performance in HASP and that sort of thing. Um, the other question that I had is just whether you also looked at the availability of HASP intertie import bids, um, you know, outside of the EIM, just the, the amount of intertie import bids that were not scheduled or selected at the same time that the EIM advisory transfers were selected in HASP just to see if there's, you know, if there was supply in the market that could have been paired to some extent with those, um, with those uh, exports, um, that was more of an on par type of a, uh, uh, transaction, you know, just realizing that the economic solution is doing whatever it does, but I'm just curious if there were other resources out there other than the EIM advisory transfers um, that were available in HAS that did, did not get committed. Yes, and that's a good point, Dan, and we do have metrics in the report. Uh, we didn't show them here in the deck, but I believe we presented maybe in the previous round of the analysis. And we were very targeted to identify any supply volume available uh, on the interties, and we indeed provide that information in, in a grouping by price range, just to give a sense of how they were coming, whether they were coming at a very high price, whether they were coming as self scales. So we do have that information. So I would suggest you to, to check the, the final version or even the preliminary analysis that we put together because we develop a set of metrics to, to tackle that specific point. And yes, and for, depending on the day, obviously, there is a different level of volume that was not clear on the interties. And I would take that with a grain of salt because obviously there are many factors to consider, right? It's not just a capacity issue whether you have additional interties or not, but also whether they may be coming from interties that are already binding and therefore they cannot flow or any other condition beyond just the capacity that may prevent them to, to clear in the market. So I would encourage you to, to check that and that set of metrics and see if that suffice your expectation of looking deeper into what was happening with the, with the interties and bidding and supply. Great, I appreciate it. I must have just missed that when, when looking through the report. But uh, thanks again, very detailed and great information that I think will be very useful for this and you know, future policy initiatives. So appreciate the work. Thank you, Dan. Moving on to the next caller. Please go ahead, a line is unmuted. Hi, Guillermo, this is Libby Kirby from Bonneville. Um, I just need a quick reminder, if you don't mind. Uh, when it says these are unrealized imports, can you remind me, it, it seems like in the second slide, uh, there's exports without those imports and uh, and things were tight, but in the third slide, it looks like it just sort of like a re-optimization, um, as in potentially just the optimization chose to uh, use internal resources rather than imports. Can, can you remind me of when we say things are unrealized, is that like uh, uh, imports that were uh, optimized in the half or like don't show up as in something goes wrong or something um, like those resources are not actually available or is it just a re-optimization um, from period to period? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Let, let me unpack that. Uh, when I refer to unrealized, it's no more than the delta of the import transfers, and we're talking about transfers, it's not about hourly intertie transactions, this is only import transfers. 
these are, this is a delta of import transfer from HAS or FMM towards RTD. You may have, let's say, 3,000 megawatts of import transfers clearing HAS, and for whatever condition, it happens that RTD is able to clear only 1,000. The unrealized transfers between HAS and RTD in this case is going to be 2,000 megawatts. And as to why that may happen, at the end of the day, it's a factor of what the market is clearing. There may be changing conditions. There may be uncertainty realized in different areas that now prevent that supply to come along the import transfers. There may be some supply that is no longer available. You name it. At the end of the day, is for whatever reason, this is the transfer that eventually clears in the RTD market. In some cases, it's going to be economic displacement, reoptimization, but also changing conditions that may happen from the HASP to the RTD market. And just to give you a reference, right, we are talking about two different time frames. The advisory import transfers are basically uh, determined about 70 minutes in advance of the hour versus the RTD transfers that are real, uh, estimated seven and a half minutes before the, the binding interval. So we are really talking about at least an hour of difference that conditions can change and things are going to happen, and some of those are going to really be reflected now naturally only on RTD. Yeah. Okay. Thank that? you, Guillermo. That's really helpful. Yeah, that's okay. helpful. Thank you. Uh, operator, we have one more question in the queue. Yes, we do have one more caller in the queue. Please go ahead. The line is unmuted. Hi, this is Lindsay Slickway from NV Energy. Um, my question is actually on the previous slide. Um, yeah, so I am, so the real-time self-schedule exports, um, those are really only real-time, right? This isn't day-ahead self-schedules or anything that was done previously, correct? Correct, these are just those showing up until the real time time frame. If there were exports clearing has or they have a position from the day ahead eh, and they carry over into the real time, they are not considered real time. These are only last minute showing up in real time directly. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Eh, do we still have a question from Libby or is that from the previous round? Uh, okay. That's from the previous one, yes. Okay, let's move to the second topic, please. Then. One more. The next slide, the next set is the second topic related to the interaction of load conformance and the interaction that it may have in either the market or the resource efficiency evaluation. And as part of the discussion that took place during the previous phase of the resource efficiency evaluation enhancement, there has been this concern about the utilization of the load conformance. Uh, we have explained different ways in different forms the, the reason why we have this load conformance, how the load conformance is utilized in the HASP FMM market to position resources to gain the flexibility. It somehow help uh, the market to get the capacity uh, position properly in advance of the upcoming time frame. While the load conformance in RTD is really more to true up imbalances that are happening in real time as just in time. And that is one of the main reasons you can see that the profiles of the load conformance between the markets is quite different. Now, the concern is really more about the conformance apply to either the HASP or the FMM market. Generally, they are quite the same. And one of the concerns was that by using this load conformance, uh, the KISO system may be positioning itself to be in a better shape to pass the resource efficiency evaluation. And we have done a lot of analysis in that area, and one of the items was that, well, by having this load conformance, the KISO may be accessing additional import transfers and that could help uh, to position better its system, have additional supply that could eventually help to, to pass uh, uh, more easily the resource efficiency evaluation. Through the different analysis that we have done in this area, uh, we have shown that that is indeed not the case. Indeed, what we have seen and we have assessed counterfactually is by every megawatt that we put as load conformance into the real-time market, 
how much of that translates into an import transfer. And this uh, picture that you have in this slide is just a, a sample of a specific set of days. And in these days, what you can see is that the blue trend, the line in blue, uh, reflects the load conformance applicable in the real-time market. And the bars in purple stand for the amount of import transfers that are resulting from applying that load conformance. And if you take a specific value, you are going to see that it is only a fraction of the load conformance that eventually translates into additional import transfers. And again, these are advisory transfers because eventually they are going to be re-optimized in the real-time market. And that is one of the findings that we had from the very first round of the analysis. Next slide, please. One of the complexities was if we try to apply somehow a load conformance logic into the resource efficiency evaluation, given the range of values that the load conformance can take at any point on time during the day, what would be a reasonable value to consider? Well, here is where the challenge comes, right? Because depending on the day, depending on the conditions, the application of a load conformance value can result in a wide range of import transfers. And you can place in any point in these graphs, and let's say on the left-hand side, if we place in the range of the x-axis, let's say 2,000 megawatts, we apply a load conformance in half of 2,000 megawatts. What is the resulting import transfer for that application of 2,000 megawatts of load conformance? Well, every dot is a market solution for a specific interval that we have in the real-time market, and you can see that the range of those dots can go anywhere between zero, effectively up to almost 1,500 megawatts. So depending on the day, depending on the system conditions, depending on the economics, you may get quite different outcome of import transfers, even when you apply the very same value of load conformance. And that poses a challenge, right, because if you want to come with a value that is going to be reflective of the implications of import transfers because of load conformance, which value to take in all this range between 0 and 1,500 megawatts? And it is beyond the complexity of trying to account for the implications of load conformance in the transfers. It's about the, the correctness of trying to add the load conformance to the resource efficiency evaluation. Next slide, please. And one of the complications is that the market is a complex machine. When we impose a load conformance, that load conformance can be reflected in many different dimensions in the market. It can increase import transfers. It can reduce export transfers. It can increase imports, reduce exports. It can incrementally schedule more resources internal to the CAISO, or it can relax the power balance constraint, or any permutation of all this together, just because it depends, again, on the specific conditions of the case you are analyzing, the system conditions of that day, the economics of that specific interval. And what we have here is that, in general, for the specific days of the analysis that we implemented, the trend is quite persistent, and that is the majority of the load conformance that is applied in the market is absorbed or is reflected as additional dispatches for kinds of resources. So there is a, a strong correlation that the large volume of load conformance translates into incrementally dispatching kinds of resources. Why is that relevant? First, because it's telling us that the load conformance is already inherently accounted for in the resource efficiency evaluation, and that may be something that is not quite obvious, but let me just connect the dots here. The main point is that by the time we put a load conformance into either the HAS or the FMN market, we are going to alter the market solution, and we're going to alter the dispatches internal to the CAISO. When we 
increase the demand in the real-time market because we put additional load conformance, one of the consequences is that we incrementally dispatch more resources to meet that extra demand. Along the way of bringing potentially more import transactions and bringing more import transfers. But this slide shows you the, the share of the load conformance that translates into incremental dispatches of Kaiser resources. And why is that relevant to the resource efficiency evaluation? Well, very simple. Because when we do the flexible ramping test, uh, it's a flex test. We need to have a relative uh, starting point. That starting point is the last FMM solution prior to running the test. So when we apply a load conformance to the FMM market and we increase resources and dispatches to meet that load conformance, effectively we are going to be increasing the starting point in the evaluation of the flexible ramping test. And by the time we go into the resource efficiency test, the flexible ramping test, the flexible capacity that now is made available or is left available for the test is reduced. Let's say you have a resource that has a Pmax of 300 megawatts. Under no conformance in the FMM, that resource is dispatched, let's say, to 200 megawatts. So in the resource efficiency evaluation, in the flex test, that resource is going to be with a flexible ramp capability of 200 megawatts, the starting point of 100 all the way up to the Pmax of 300. When we apply now the load conformance to the FMM, FMM is going to most likely increase the dispatch of that resource, let's say from 100 to 200. Now the starting point in the flexible ramping test is going to be 200. The Pmax doesn't change, it's going to be still 300. Effectively, now the RAM capability available in the test from that resource is going to be only 100 megawatts. The extra 100 megawatts that was without load conformance is already utilized in the FMM solution. So we are not adding supply, we are not adding capacity flexibility to the test by using the load conformance. Indeed, all what we are doing is uh, utilizing the limited flex capability up front by ramping up that resource prior to the evaluation of the resource efficiency evaluation. That means that when we come into the resource efficiency evaluation, we already depleted that flexible capacity to some extent because of the load conformance. So the load conformance effect is already reflected in the assessment of the flexible ramping test. And obviously, it's going to represent less capacity available in the flexible ramping test, and potentially it's going to create a conditions to fail more, uh, to fail quicker or more easily the flexible ramping test. That is indeed the consequence of having the low conformance rather than the other way around of uh, helping or creating more capacity for the Kaiser to pass the test. Uh, this is what we have for the second topic. So before we move to the next one, let's see if we have any questions. Uh, operator, Isabella. Sure. As a reminder, uh, please press the raise hand icon just above the chat panel if you have uh, connected to the computer audio. You'll hear a beep tone when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Okay, then we can move to the next topic. Good morning, everyone. This is Amber Motley um, the short, on the short-term forecasting team. Um, we wanted to cover a little bit about one part of this project, which was to further talk about um, the enhancements to the flexible ramp product uncertainty requirement calculation. This was an effort that was started with the FRP enhancements back in 2019, um, but within this particular stakeholder project, we've provided more clarity uh, as well as simulation results comparing the current histogram approach to the newly uh, called mosaic approach. Um, so ISO is proposing the mosaic model, which is incorporating weather information into the estimation of the uncertainty requirement. Uh, the mosaic model is utilizing quantile regression as the technique with the load, wind, and solar data as regressor, regress, 
regressors underneath um, the quantile regression. Um, that particular methodology was compared to the histogram approach, where the histogram approach at this time does not incorporate weather information. It does look back a period of time, um, looking at historical data, but does not trigger off of certain weather conditions to form the requirements going forward. That's the biggest enhancement as we go into the flexible ramp product uncertainty requirement calculation. What we found in the latest simulation with results posted in more detail in the, both the paper and previous presentations is that the mosaic approach has similar coverages, which is good. Um, it has a less requirement on average, and I just want to emphasize that that's on average. There's times that you see that the requirement is more um, where the need is more, um, but you also see times that the requirement is less. Um, and that on average in the simulation, it had a less requirement. That the methodology has a closer proximity to the observed uncertainty that is witnessed on the system, and that it has a comparable exceeding number um, that looks at, you know, if you are not close to that observed uncertainty, how much are you exceeding it by? The other key piece to the mosaic is it has less impact on seasonality. Um, we are looking not just at a set amount of days, you're looking at that set amount of days and in combination to the regressors, which is the load, wind, and solar components. Next slide. This was a slide that was given in previous presentations as well, but it's really showing the details um, that the enhanced quantile approach is providing marginal improvements to the uncertainty requirement calculation. So there are a number of EIM areas that were in the simulation. Um, uh, they go on the left side underneath the BAA column. And then you have the flexible ramp up requirement and the flexible ramp down requirements represented by both the histogram and the mosaic approach. So histogram is the underscore H and mosaic is the underscore M. So that you can see across the different BAAs what the different uncertainty requirement calculations look like um, in average um, across the board. Next slide. And, and lastly, I, I do want to point out that we wanted to make sure that there's increased transparency on the proposed quantile, me quantile methodology. And we've had a number of interested parties wanting to replicate the calculation. So the CAISO has posted a step-by-step -step description of that methodology. The link can be found below. Um, and that has a very step-by-step -step detail of what the methodology is and what is proposed to go live this fall. And with that, I will pause to see if there are any questions before we move to the next section. I do not right. see any callers in the queue as of now. All right, thank you. Cool, thanks Amber. Hey everyone, this is Kevin Head. I'm a senior market engineering specialist at the ISO. And I'll be kind of continuing on this conversation about the use of the quantile regression or mosaic approach uh, in these next few slides. So if we could just go to the next slide. So what we did was we took the results of the analysis that Amber just presented and ran a count counterfactual analysis to see how this new proposed enhanced requirement would affect the outcome of the flexible ramping test. Uh, so what we did was we took 2021 data, effectively all the 2021 flexible ramping sufficiency tests that occurred and replaced the market's net load uncertainty requirement, which is based on the histogram methodology. And we replaced it with the proposed enhancement, which is based on that mosaic quantile regression approach. And we re-ran the flexible ramping test using that uh, new requirement. The results are shown up here. It affects you know, a, a relatively few and absolute number terms, uh, a few of the tests, so only about a third of the 
of 1% of the tests were affected, and that winds up with being about 0.2% actually changing from on net from pass to fail. And that's mostly driven by a few BAAs, which you can see up here. We, just a few uh, points about how this was performed. So first, up through May of 2021, the flexible ramping test also was impacted by the results of the capacity test, the bid range capacity component of the RSE. So failure in the capacity test would automatically lead to a failure in the flexible ramping test. What we did, because we just wanted to focus on the toggling between the current requirement and the new proposed requirement, uh, we re-ran the flex test without respect to the capacity test. So it was basically independent of the results of the bid range capacity test, just so we can see the impact on the flexible ramping test due to the net load uncertainty requirement. And we also only looked at the upward test. This is, these are just the results of the upward test. We didn't look at the, the downward test. Uh, so that's sort of the main conclusions from here. It doesn't affect too many of the tests, and it results in a slight net increase in the number of failures on net. Though you can see, you know, some BAs have some that pit, uh, switch from pass to fail, while some also do the other direction fail to pass. So zooming in a little bit on the next slide as to when these changes in the results occur, we looked at it both seasonally and across the trading day. So on the left chart, you'll see the change in the failure rates by month, and this is also by BAA, and a darker color, like a darker blue, would indicate that those failure rates changed by a higher uh, percentage. And so just an explanation of what the numbers mean here. Uh, the numbers shown in each individual square are the change in the failure rate. And by that I mean, so if a BAA, for example, failed 1.2% of the tests using the current requirement, and then 1.3% of the tests using this proposed enhanced net load uncertainty requirement, that would show up in this table as a positive 0.1%. So that's, that's what it's showing. It's not showing a relative change in the failure rate. It's showing the absolute change in the failure rate. So you can see on the left side the monthly failure rate changes are mostly focused in the summer months of July and August, though there is also a marked increase in those uh, March months as well. And those are primarily concentrated in a few BAAs, which you can see through the darker colors here. Moving to the table on the right, this is the change in the failure rates by hour on average across the year of 2021. And you'll see that the change in the failure rates are higher in the net load peak hours, you know, 20, 21, 22, 23. Uh, though we also see some in the morning ramp hours of, I think that's eight. And then similarly to the other results we've been seeing, those results are typically concentrated in just a few BAAs. So that's sort of the main punchline of this section of the analysis, and uh, I think we can open it up to questions if anyone has any. As a reminder, uh, if you're connected to the computer audio or use the call me feature in WebEx, you may enter the question queue by using the WebEx raise hand icon located just above the chat panel. You'll hear a beep tone when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Okay. Thanks, guys. If you have any, just feel free to raise your hand, uh, but I'll pass it over to Katie for now. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? 
So, morning everybody, this is Katie Wickler with the Market Analysis Team, and I'll be wrapping it up with uh, kind of a review of the incremental analysis we did related to the NSI uncertainty requirement or the intertie deviation adder. So just as a little recap, um, in our call last month, we presented some analysis on the NSI uh, uncertainty requirement across 2021. We looked at some potential correlations between uh, NSI deviation and external factors. So this round of the analysis, we expanded to sort of look at the interplay between the NSI uncertainty requirement and the capacity test results across 2021, which is what these subsequent slides will focus on. So here we looked at the uh, upward capacity test failures for all of the BAAs across 2021 within the WEIM, and we analyzed the frequency of upward capacity test failures due to the inclusion of the NSI uncertainty requirement. So in other words, we looked at, you know, would the test have passed if the uncertainty requirement was not included in the evaluation of the upward capacity requirement that forms the basis of whether or not the entity would pass or fail the test. So we found that the entities failed the upward capacity test due to the NSI uncertainty requirement, uh, generally at higher frequencies during the summer and fall months of 2021, but there were some outliers uh, across months and BAAs. Uh, additionally, we saw that the higher frequencies of failure due to the inclusion of the NSI uncertainty requirement were not always aligned with a high number of upward capacity test failures to begin with. So, you know, for example, a metric of 100% here might only be backed up by one or two total upward capacity test failures during that month. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Next, what we did is performed a counterfactual analysis on the upward capacity test results by essentially replacing the NSI uncertainty requirement that's estimated using the historical histogram methodology with actual NSI deviation that materialized for the specific trading hour. Then we recalculated the upward capacity test um, and, and reassessed that for uh, all the months across 2021 for the BAAs. So said another way, this, this counterfactual essentially provides a measure of how much more or less frequently an entity would have passed the test if the methodology for calculating that NSI uncertainty requirement had been exactly precise all of the time that is equivalent to the actual deviation that materialized. So this table here is just an illustrative example of how the counterfactual results were analyzed to just put the numbers in the next slide into more context. So here a positive frequency indicates that the counterfactual case yielded less upward capacity test failures, which means that having you know, an exact estimation of the intertie deviation resulted in the entity passing the test more frequently. Conversely, a negative frequency means that uh, the counterfactual case yielded more upward capacity test failures, meaning that having that exact estimation actually resulted in the entity failing more frequently. Um, and then finally, a quantity of infinite indicates that the initial amount of failures was zero, and in the counterfactual case, there was a non-zero number of failures, which yields uh, an infinite result. So if we could go to the next slide. Yes, so here we have the results shown for this counterfactual analysis uh, at the monthly granularity for each BAA. Um, on the whole, we found that, uh, you know, a perfect estimation of the NSI uncertainty requirement in the upward capacity test generally yielded less upward capacity test failures across BAAs. So as a reminder, this is represented by the positive frequencies in the light blue. The months where the counterfactual case didn't perform as well and yielded uh, those negative frequencies in red were somewhat sporadic um, on a seasonal basis and inconsistent across the BAAs. Um, in addition, the counterfactual case could yield a less desirable result for one BAA and also yield a more desirable result for another BAA in the same month, for example, in the month of July. Um, this is somewhat expected, you know, due to the fact that each BAA will have different factors influencing their intertie deviation and other inputs to the capacity test. So that's all I have here, and I'll be happy to pause for any questions. Any I do not see any call. 
I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Okay. Okay. That's all what we have in the scope for this call today. Again, the reports are posted publicly. They are in the, you can find those in the section of the initiative for the resource efficiency evaluation. I also want to emphasize that this is covering the scope that was intended to cover as we committed to do it back in February 2022. And the whole purpose of this is to have an opportunity to first assess, do the analysis in these areas that we know are going to be under further discussion as part of the stakeholder initiative. And I would take that as a reference that we have completed this analysis phase. It doesn't mean that we will not do any more analysis, but at least it covers the intended scope prior to launch the formal stakeholder initiative. Uh, the information is already posted, and we are not going to be taking comments like we did in the last two rounds because now we are moving really into the formal stakeholder initiative. But through the process, through the stakeholder discussion, we are going to be actively involved and we will continue to support this initiative with any other analysis or factual information that is needed to to have a better understanding of the dynamics of the topics that are under discussion. Thank you for your time. Thank you also for the feedback that you gave us to shape better the direction of the analysis. And we will continue this discussion through now the formal stakeholder initiative. That's all what we have for today, Isabella. Thank you. All right, thanks, Guillermo, Amber, Kevin, and uh, Katie. That's it for today. Thank you all for joining us and um, have a great rest of your day. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.